Welcome back, geology fans! So far we have looked at the sedimentary structures that form at the time of deposition, the primary sedimentary structures, but now we take a look at the secondary structures that form after deposition. We already looked at compaction, cementation, and slight recrystallization, so let's just note that those also occur after deposition and look at the more informative secondary features. And we'll start with the smallest undissolved clasts, the clays, or mud. And we really shouldn't overlook mud, as about 80% of the surface of the Earth is covered in clay-sized sediment. In the silicate sheet mineral episode, we noted that clay is mostly plate silicates, some of which will expand when water gets in between the sheets and then contract when the clay dries out again. This results in mud cracks. But as mud is easily eroded at the surface, we often see the mud cracks preserved in mirror image as mud crack casts in a non-mud deposit like sandstone. Mud cracks can be used to tell you that there was mud present, if you only see the cast. And it also tells you that the mud was exposed to the air. An interesting fact, considering mud is usually deposited in very slow-moving water. And, and which way was originally the up direction? Now, this is the first time today to mention this concept again, so let's pause. It should make perfect sense that sedimentary rocks deposit in an orderly fashion, starting from the bottom and progressing to the top. This allows us to use the law of superposition to say that rocks on the bottom are older. But what if rocks get tilted up on edge or even overturned? Which way is up, that is, which way it was originally up, becomes very important in telling the story in the proper order. So mud cracks. They curl upward. They cup in the up direction. So casts of these mud cracks show cracks as bulges out of the bottom of the overlying cast rock. Cracks also get smaller down from the surface, so if the mud is preserved and cut on side view, we can see those cracks pinching downward. Soft mud can also bulge downward as other material, usually sand again, loads on top of the soft, water-rich clay. The result is something we call load sagging in the mud, which results in load casts bulging out of the depressing bottom of the overlying bed, and thus can also be used as an up indicator. Mud often gets into vugs, that is, holes in the rocks of any kind. These holes, vugs, often fill with sedimentary material, both clastically and chemically. Clastic material, often mud or silt, gets into these vugs and settles to the bottom of the hole, making layers perpendicular to the direction of gravity. Over time, minerals may precipitate out into the upper portion of the vug, resulting in an up indicator with sediment down and crystals up. One dinosaur makes one skeleton, but makes a lot of footprints that presses down into the lower bed and bulge out on the bottom of the overlying bed. And not just dinosaurs, but any organism that make tracks or even burrows. We know animals burrow down from the top of the sediment stack into the lower sediment, so we can get up direction and some aspects of the organism's life activity, its niche. Organisms burrowing into sediment can also lead to a general sedimentary feature called bioturbation, a mixing up of the soil after it was deposited. Different organisms make different tracks and burrows, and as we will see, they can often tell us even more information about the environment of deposition. Now, this overlying sandstone bed with dinosaur tracks sticking out of the bottom of the bed actually infilled the tracks made in floodplain mud, and it is so bioturbated in this area, we call it trampled ground, as we do with cattle, but more informally we call it dinoturbated, or at least I do. I once had a student say, that must have been a really heavy dinosaur to compress the solid rock that much. And then he looked a little disappointed when I told him the dinosaur stepped in soft sediment, which later lithified into this hard rock. But this keys us into the fact that sediment can deform in all kinds of ways while it's still unconsolidated, that is, the opposite of lithified. It's just a bunch of loose sediment or mud. You know, we preach in geology to consider context. And one principle is that if an area has been compressed, it will have folding and compressive reverse faults, and everything in the area should be affected. But large areas of flat-lying rock layers are probably not overturned, and in such cases, 
Folded rock over undeformed rock always shows itself to be soft sediment deformation on top of more solid layers that remain unaffected. This soft sediment deformation can be made by gravity and slope combined with a triggering mechanism such as an earthquake or a storm. And rainstorms can make another soft sediment deformation that can tell us up direction. Raindrop impressions. At least, they're impressions on top of the bed, but they become outward dimples cast into the bottom of an overlying bed. You know, I always marvel at these tiny sedimentary features, knowing I'm seeing record of a rainstorm, often hundreds of millions of years before my eyes were here to see this evidence. But it's a little harder to imagine what's going on underground, as we don't exist there, but, you know, you can imagine a lot of secondary features occur underground. We already mentioned cementation, but precipitation of minerals from groundwater into a sedimentary rock can make a, a variety of other forms, like agates, cherts, flints, and other microcrystalline quartz concretions, which tend to happen as dissolved silica precipitates around a nucleus. Now, several minerals precipitate around nuclei, by which I mean a central object which initiates the precipitation process underground. Sometimes an empty space, a vug, is enough, and you can grow these crystals from the outside in to make geodes, partially or fully filled in. And in many other cases, an organic particle is the nucleus that starts the precipitation from the central material outward. For that reason, concretions and shales are very tempting to crack open as they often contain fossils that initiated their growth. They have little prizes inside. But a, a large fossil is not always the nucleus. Any organics, right down to manure, could do the trick, mainly because bacteria that decompose organics consume oxygen. If a mineral drops out in such oxygen-depleted environments, they can often take on a layered appearance as the growing reduction sphere pulses in its growth. Simultaneously, or more precisely, pina contemporaneously, there's our big word for the day, it means happening at the same place at the same time. Anyways, pina contemporaneously, as the reduction sphere grows, the precipitating mineral may pulse in and drape the outside of the reduction sphere periodically to produce lisagang banding. This is a beautiful concentric pattern seen in sedimentary and some porous metamorphic rocks that have uncertain origin, but an organic or at least deoxygenated reduced center is often suspect. Now, recrystallization is definitely a secondary feature happening after deposition, but we also see dissolution, the dissolving of minerals that may re-precipitate into a concretion, geode, nodule, or layer somewhere else. Soluble minerals like calcite are very susceptible to this, and limestone that gets buried and compressed forms secondary sedimentary structures called stylolites, which are jagged lines of insoluble, often clay, minerals which are left behind as the soluble calcite moves away with groundwater. The maximum amplitude of the stylolite estimates the minimum thickness of limestone rock dissolved away under compression and groundwater flow. We may also see the calcite starting to recrystallize, but then, you know, if we go too far in the solid state, we would be into the metamorphic rocks. And it's tempting to rush to our last rock type here, but before we do, we will take one more look at sedimentary information bombs by summarizing their environments of deposition, one of the most important pieces of information you can get from sedimentary rocks, here on Earth Explorations.